that I played. We're going to discuss this with an expert, which is not me, and that's why joining us right now, we have uh, Dr. Bill Messer from OHSU, who's going to be uh, talking about this. And, and Doctor, I really appreciate you being here for it. You know, that's a, it's a scary term to say bubonic plague, obviously. Uh, something that uh, humanity is, is trained to be afraid of. But uh, talking about this now, I wondered if you could just maybe walk us through what this case was here in Deschutes County and, and what exactly happened. Yeah, so um, the, I think the sort of features of the, of the presentation of the case in Deschutes County early in February or the way that we often see bubonic plague show up um, from time to time in North America, and particularly in the United States. And, and what appears to have happened in this case is that um, the patient had an outside cat who probably tangled with a rodent or rat would be the most likely suspect that, that was carrying bubonic plague. And the, the cat itself probably got plagued from, from that animal encounter and then subsequently passed it on to, um, to her owner who developed symptoms of, of plague, which are, are classically sort of fever, and feeling very awful, often headache, um, followed by often swelling in the lymph nodes. And somewhere along her clinical course, she went and sought medical care. And it sounds as if, though I don't know the actual case history, the diagnosis was made relatively quickly and she was started on appropriate antibiotics to, to treat her illness. Um, but this is often how we see plague um, appearing in people um, in the modern era, as opposed to the, the sort of historical and even biblical references that come with plague. And in talking about that, just, you know, with that context of, you know, the Middle Ages and bubonic plague and the Black Plague and all of that, how does this compare, this version compare to that version? Well, they're, you know, very different um, in terms of, of how we worry about a case like this showing up in the modern era versus the appearance of a, of a case um, in, in the Middle Ages when you know, nothing was known to the extent that we know it now about how it was caused, how to stop it, um, how to treat it, um, how to yeah, how to prevent it um, from from spreading through populations. So we, of course, have all of that information now. In addition to that, I think it's really important to point out that uh, there are so many features of the way that we live now, our built environment, our public sanitation, our hygiene, uh, many, many things that we could kind of go through that make the setting in which this case was acquired so very different from the way that plague was acquired historically during the Black Death, for example, in, in the Middle Ages in the 1300s. And this person in particular, you know, sounds like they acquired it from their cat and their cat being outdoors, probably some, I'm going to guess maybe somewhere in rural Deschutes County, but out in Deschutes County nonetheless. And how, and you said that it, it may be tangled with another wild animal, whoever that could, with a wild animal. So how frequent is that and how common is that, that wild animals, I guess we'll start with Oregon, are carrying the bubonic plague? Right. So strictly speaking, we don't have really good estimates of, of what the number or proportion of animals that are wild animals in Oregon or, or elsewhere in, in plague endemic areas in, in the U.S. are. But if you look at, at the human cases, I think the, the previous case uh, in Oregon was maybe in 2015 and before that in 2012. So really kind of rare and sporadic. But what this does tell us is that is that low levels of transmission of the bacteria that, that cause plague, Yersinia pestis, is probably moving slowly but constantly through um, wild animal, probably primarily wild rodent populations in uh, in eastern and central Oregon, and that occasionally uh, a domesticated animal is going to tangle with one of these animals or be bitten by fleas that had picked up the bacteria from these animals, and then and then they bite uh, they bite the domesticated animal. Now that still is one step away from us, and 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 an unanswered question really is how many unexplained pet deaths in areas where plague exists among the wild animal populations might be attributable to this. That's that's certainly a possible um, way that this shows up. Silently, we don't recognize it, so we don't look for it really. But but we know that it probably happens from time to time. And then the bacteria still has to make the leap from the pet to the owner of the pet. That can be through uh, a flea bite, or it can be through exposure to secretions from from the sick animal, usually saliva um, or. Uh, 
something along those lines would be would be most typical, although um, it would really have to be a high bacterial burden. It's it's interesting to note that cats are, in fact, capable of transmitting plague that way. Um, they get very sick and they get a high load of this bacteria in their system, and they're capable of transmitting it directly to their owners without the intervention of a flea, so to speak. And so that that is interesting, though. So it's even beyond just a flea. So talking about that, you know, for this person's cat, and I don't know the specific instance of what the symptoms were, but in general, what would symptoms be of, say, a domesticated pet who does become infected with bubonic plague? Right. So uh, unfortunately, because the pet can't really tell us how it feels, it's really down to how the animal is behaving. And so you, you look for things like lethargy, not eating, not drinking, out of character behavior for the animal if they typically are active and they're not active or they can't get comfortable and typically they're comfortable. If you're able to tell your animals or your pet's temperature, then they get fevers just like humans do. Um, so those are all of the signs that would be worrisome for, for our pet being sick um, in any in, in any context or from any disease, but certainly um, for plague, those are also the symptoms that you would look for in your pet. And is this something that, just to, just to clarify to you on the pet side of things, so obviously this cat had it, is this something that dogs can also contract just as easily? Mm -hmm. do, I, I don't know if I can say just as easily, and I'm not uh, a, a veterinary uh, expert, uh, but you know what I understand as I have studied this disease um, over the years is that, yes, dogs can get it too. They don't reportedly get as sick as cats do. Cats really have a higher death rate from this than dogs do, but dogs can, can certainly contract it. They can get ill from it, and some of them probably also die from it. And when it comes to the to the human side, now you mentioned there is certain antibiotics and things they can get on, so it sounds like this is something that is treatable. Is this if it's found in the early stages, or is there risk if it's not taken care of early on? Well, the sooner we can initiate or start treatment, the better in, in all cases. And um, left untreated, the mortality or the death rate from plague can be quite high. It's not, not 100%, but it's still quite high. Um, but as long as we're able to make the diagnosis while um, the person is able to, to bring themselves in, provide a history, tell us what has happened um, so that people can make the right diagnosis. Usually, no promises can be made, but usually you can get ahead of it at that point with antibiotics. What do you think are the most important things for people to know, just for the general public, to know about uh, bubonic plague here in, in, the, in the natural world in, in the Northwest? Well, I think there are a couple of ways to approach answering that question. I think the first thing I would say actually is um, it's 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 okay to be interested. It's okay to be a little bit scared. It's okay to be a little bit concerned. Um, plague as a disease is is so intertwined with our with our history um, that it would it's just natural to say, hey. Plague. What the heck is going on here? And and I and so I wouldn't want to trivialize anybody's interest or concern. Well, you know, this is one woman in Deschutes County. Now, this is a really interesting thing that, that just happened, and and we should treat this as a learning opportunity because it is um it is it is something that that presses all kinds of buttons for us. Um, all of that being said, um, it it is it is a rare event. Um, and and we know that just when we look at the number of cases that have happened in North America since about 1900 when it appeared here. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, it is one more thing to think about that I think a lot of us already think about already when we encounter a sick animal, um, if we're out hiking a wild animal that's sick, or if our cat brings us a sick animal, or if our pets get sick, we think about stuff like rabies, we think about things that we don't want to get, and therefore we don't want to touch the animal. Um, and if our pet is sick, we want to get the pet in for care. Uh, that is part of how we need to think about about this particular event too. This is one more thing, especially if you live in Central Oregon or Eastern Oregon, um, where where we know that the disease lives in the wild animal population that you that you really want to think about. And my guess is that the physicians who saw this patient when she came into the into the hospital, in fact, probably did rely on that 
pre-existing knowledge um, to include this in their in their thinking about what could be making this person sick. But but in in general, it's it's not something to be alarmed about. It is certainly something to be interested in. It is something to think about when you encounter a sick animal, especially in these areas where where the disease is known to to circulate. That, and that's I think that's that's great to know and, and, hear, and to hear it from you as well. Um, one other question I had: Are there any specific other than staying away from sick animals? You know, if you do see an animal that's sick, particularly one in the wild, stay away from that. I would guess is the right thing to do. Is there anything else that people can do just as a precautionary measure if they're out, say, hiking or enjoying uh, nature there in in uh, that part of Oregon? Yeah. If you look at CDC and the Oregon Health Authority um, guidance, the things that really get emphasized are, um, first of all, if it's your pet, you know, outside pets are at increased risk for acquiring these things. So ask the question, does my does my pet need to be an outside pet because I am potentially exposing them to this sort of uh, sort of infection if you live in the right area? Doing things that limit the number of, of rodent pests that live outside your house, wood piles, trash heaps, compost piles, all of those things are attractant and think about how those are or arranged around your house. Um, we know that it's transmitted by fleas, so flea control um, with our pets is something that we kind of routinely do anyhow, but it's certainly something that you would add to things that you would do to, to make sure that you're safe. And then, of course, you can protect yourself from flea bites with, um, you know, DEET or uh, similar insect repellents will also pre prevent tick bite or sorry flea bites. Um, uh, and then you know monitoring yourself for symptoms. Uh, if you if you are getting sick after you've gone for a hike, is this something that I should think about? And then something else that we've already touched on, which is if you encounter a dead or a lethargic animal, you know not handling it, or if you handle it, you know handling it with gloves, a mask, the kind of you know, we now know what the word PPE means because we were inundated it, uh, with it for, for the last several years. But but thinking about PPE and not just uh, casually picking up uh, a dead or a dying rat or squirrel um, that's that's been brought to your back doorstep by your cat. Yeah, that's a, a very very good thing to remember. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to do that anyway. But uh, certainly make sure yeah you're protecting yourself if you do that. Well. Uh, Doctor, you know, thank you very much for joining us just to give us this, this actual, you know, honest advice and, and knowledge about this. Anything else that you think people should know? Um, I, I would just emphasize the so a couple of the things that we that we already touched on that this is that this is not the plague of the Middle Ages. That this is a disease that we know exists in wild animals in Oregon. It's a reason to be cautious around wild animals, particularly sick ones. Um, and and that and that and that it's a treatable condition. Um, and and lastly, as I said earlier, I think it's really good to be interested and ask questions about this. It's a unique opportunity to learn about something that is both rare but living uh, per, mostly unnoticed on our literal back doorstep. Well, thank you again. You know, really appreciate your knowledge and joining us here for Fox Twelve Now. And uh, and yeah, I mean. Thank you. You've, you've explained a lot to me that I had no idea about, so I really, really uh, am thankful for your knowledge. Yeah, well, you're welcome. I really appreciated the opportunity to talk about this very interesting disease. Fantastic. And um, I'll just say goodbye here to everybody else who's, who's watching. Uh, thank you for joining us here for Fox 12 Now. Again, we live stream here every weekday uh, and throughout the afternoon. And coincidentally enough, here in about 10 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about something else that, that you could encounter in the outdoors, and that is cougars. Uh, as you know, over the weekend, there, there was an encounter in Washington where five uh, cyclists were, were attacked by a cougar. And we're going to discuss, you know, what, what the likelihood is of that. What do you do if you encounter a cougar? Uh, I've got somebody from the Washington, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is going to be joining me. So that's, again, at 2 p.m. Pacific. If you are watching live, you can go right to wherever you're watching me right now. I'll be right there. So that's a good place to do that. And also, if you want to watch the segments afterward, also a good place. So Facebook, YouTube, I, I would say the website's the best place, kptv.com or, of course, the Fox 12 Oregon app. But thank you for joining me. I'll sign up for now. We'll get ready for that one. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.